Welcome. My name is Sarah Harris. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. This is the first of several sessions where I'm going to talk about MIPS FPGA. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is MIPS FPGA and also how you get the materials which are freely available to academics. I'll talk about a brief history of the MIPS architecture and then dive in to MIPS FPGA itself, background, core and system, and its interfaces. So the first question is, what is MIPS FPGA? It's an unobfuscated soft core processor available from MIPS LLC for academic use. We provide supporting materials in three packages, the Getting Started Guide, Labs, and the System on Chip package. The Getting Started Guide provides the tools for getting MIPS FPGA up and running and the core itself, so the Verilog files for the core and the system. The labs package contains 25 hands-on labs for experimenting, analyzing, and modifying the MIPS FPGA system. The final package available is the MIPS FPGA system on chip package that allows you to run Linux on the MIPS FPGA system. This is all available for download at the link shown here. So after browsing to that website, scroll down until you see teaching and training materials, and then click on the package that you'd like, and it will lead you to a registration or login page where you can make the request. Before using the MIPS FPGA package, we recommend that students already understand the basics of digital design and computer architecture. So some example textbooks that teach this material are Digital Design and Computer Architecture by Harrison Harris, or Computer Organization and Design. So let's talk about a brief history of the MIPS architecture. It was developed by John Hennessy and his colleagues at Stanford in the 1980s. It was one of the first commercial reduced instruction set or RISC architectures. And Hennessy co-founded a company, MIPS Computer Systems, later called MIPS Technologies, using this architecture. It's been used in many commercial systems, including Silicon Graphics Workstations, Nintendo Machines, and Cisco servers and is studied by a majority of universities. There have been over 5 billion MIPS microprocessors sold. Historically, some of the MIPS processors are the MIPS R3000, R4000, and R10000. They were used in the 1980s and 1990s, for example, in Silicon Graphics workstations. Some of the embedded systems include the M4K and M14K. So for example, Microchip's popular PIC32 line of microcontrollers is based on the M4K core. Current MIPS cores include Microaptive, Interaptive, and Proaptive, and the Warrior class. MIPS FPGA is a Microaptive core. This is a highly efficient, compact, embedded core based on the M14K architecture. Interaptive and Proaptive are higher performance versions of the core. The newest line of MIPS cores are called the Warrior class, and they range from high performance to embedded cores. So let's dive into the MIPS FPGA system itself. As I said, MIPS FPGA is a commercial soft core processor available to universities. Each faculty member must register to obtain MIPS FPGA, and it may not be put into silicon. Any publication should acknowledge MIPS FPGA, and the MIPS academic community would really like to see what you're doing with the system. So let's dive into the core and system. The MicroAptive core is a five-stage pipeline it operates at 1.5 dry stone MIPS per megahertz. It has two-way associative instruction and data caches, two kilobytes each, and a memory management unit, an MMU, and a 16-entry translation look-side buffer, TLB. Here's a figure of the overall core, and let's dive into each part and take a closer look. In the center of the core, we have the execution unit with a system coprocessor, including an instruction decoder. Supporting that, we have general purpose processors and a multiply divide unit. On the bottom of this figure, you can see the memory system, the MMU, the caches, and the cache controller. And at the very bottom, we can see interfaces to the scratch pad RAM. One important interface that we'll use later in our modules is the JTAG, also called the EJTAG interface. This interface is used for programming and real-time debugging of the core. Another interface that we'll use repeatedly is the HB Lite bus. This is used for interfacing with memories and peripherals. And finally, at the top, 
We have the UDI interface, the user defined instruction interface, and the interrupt interface. We'll show how to use both of these in later sessions. MIPS FPGA also offers a coprocessor 2 interface. So again, here's the overall view of our MIPS FPGA core and its interfaces. And as a recap, MIPS FPGA has a five-stage pipeline, four kilobyte instruction and data caches, an MMU and TLB, performance counters, input synchronizers. It doesn't have a DSP or coprocessor 2 or shadow registers. And it includes the interfaces of the HB Lightbus, EJTAG, and Core Extend for user-defined instructions. We'll talk about the first two interfaces in this session, and the last one we'll talk about in a later session. MIPS FPGA has three operating modes, kernel, user, and debug. At reset, the processor starts at virtual address hex BFC0, all zeros. So this is the address of the first instruction that will be fetched upon reset. We can take a look at the MIPS FPGA memory map that includes 32-bit virtual addresses, so address 0 all the way up through hex all Fs. The memory map is broken up into different segments. KSEG 0 and KSEG 1 both map to physical addresses starting at hex 0. So there's a fixed mapping for these segments. So for example, hex A all zeros maps to physical address hex all zeros. Likewise, hex 8 all zeros maps to that same physical location, hex all zeros. Note that the memory in KSEG 1 is both uncached and unmapped in the TLB. So all instructions are fetched from external memory and not cache. Here's a figure of the MIPS FPGA system. It includes the core on the left and some peripherals and memory on the right. The system has one kilobyte of boot code space and 256 kilobytes of space for user code. If we look at the physical memory map, we notice that the boot code starts at physical address hex 1fc all zeros. Remember that this is the address of the first instruction that we fetched upon reset. And the user code space starts at physical address hex 0. Let's take a look at the MIPS FPGA interfaces. On the left we have the system interfaces, clock and reset. Next we have the EJTAG interface that allows us to program and debug the system. And on the right, we have interfaces to the FPGA board, LEDs, switches, and in some of the labs that we'll talk about, we'll extend that interface to other peripherals. The HB Lite interface allows us to interface with these peripherals as well as memory. So let's talk a little bit more about these interfaces. The system interface includes the two main signals, reset, N, that N at the end, indicates that it's low asserted, and the clock. You'll know that these signals are prefixed with the SI prefix indicating system interface. On the Nexus 4 DDR board, the system runs at 50 megahertz, which is derived from the onboard 100 megahertz clock. The HB Lite bus allows us to interface with memory and peripherals. It has a 32-bit address bus, H address, a read data bus, HR data, a write data bus, HW data, and then a write enable signal and a clock. The clock on the HB Lite bus also runs at 50 megahertz. You'll note that the HB Lite bus signals have the H prefix to indicate that they're associated with the HB Lite bus. The MIPS FPGA processor acts as the master of the HB Lite bus. So it outputs the clock, the hwrite signal, that write enable signal, the address, and the write data, hw data. It receives as input the 32-bit hr data or read data signal. We can then hang peripherals and memory off of this bus to interface with the MIPS FPGA core. The MIPS FPGA system has two memory blocks, RAM0 and RAM1. RAM0 contains the boot code memory space. RAM1 contains the user code memory space. We have a third module, the GPIO or general purpose IO module that allows us to interface with the switches and LEDs on the FPGA board. 
We have two additional modules, the address decoder and the multiplexer. The address decoder detects the address and selects one of the modules, and the multiplexer selects which module should produce the read data, HR data. The HB light bus is pipelined, so it produces the address in one clock cycle and the associated data in the next clock cycle. So as we look here for an HB light write operation, the address and the H write enable signal are produced in cycle one, the leftmost cycle, and the data to be written, HW data, is produced in that second cycle in the data phase. You'll notice that memory accesses overlap. So the memory write request in cycle one completes in cycle two, but in cycle two, the request for the next memory address, address B in this case, initiates. The timing of a read on the HB light bus is similar to that of a write. The address being requested is given in cycle one, and the value being read is produced by the slave in cycle two. You'll notice that the H write signal is low in cycle one to indicate a read instead of a write. The interfaces to the Nexus 4 DDR board include interfaces to the LEDs, switches, and push buttons. Each of the signals is prefixed with the I-O prefix to indicate an input-output signal. Let's take a look at the Nexus 4 DDR board itself. In the center of the board, you can see the FPGA, the Arctic 7 FPGA. And then we have interfaces, the USB programmer port and power switch at the top left. We have the push button switches on the bottom right, the switches on the very bottom of the board with the LEDs right above that, and then we have a CPU reset button or processor reset button just above the push button switches. You will also notice the EJTAG interface on the bottom right of the board. To access these inputs and outputs on the FPGA board, we map them to memory addresses. So the LEDs we memory map to address hex BF8L0s. This corresponds to a virtual address hex 1F8L0s. And similarly, we also memory map the switches and the push buttons. So in that way, we can read or write these IOs using regular reads and writes in our high-level code. If we look at our physical memory map, we notice that this range, hex 1F8L0s, is unpopulated with physical memory. We can write to the LEDs using a regular store word instruction. So in this case, we put some random value in register seven, in this case, hex 543. We load upper immediate hex BF80 into register five. That makes register five the virtual address of the LEDs. And then we write the value in register seven, hex 543, into that memory mapped I.O. address into hex bf 8 l zeros. This would cause the LEDs to light up with that pattern, hex 543. Similarly, we can read values from the switches by again loading that base address of the memory mapped I.O., hex bf 8 l zeros, and then loading or reading into register 10 the value being produced by the switches. So we do a load word, $10, $4.5, so that gives us the address hex BF8 all zeros and a four. So that's the overview of the MIPS FPGA system. In later sessions, I'll talk about how you can experiment with MIPS FPGA, run programs on the system, and learn digital design, computer architecture, embedded system principles, and many other topics.